let's open up our hearts and open up our Bibles uh, to the book of Philemon. The book of Philemon, it's going to be after the pastoral epistles and right before the book of Hebrews. And it's just a single chapter long. And it is a unique epistle because it is a letter that is written directly to a man um, named Philemon, thus the title. And uh, it is regarding the topic of two Christian men who are, they have a strain in their relationship. Now, <laughs> what's interesting is that Philemon, not only is he a Christian, Onesimus, he's a Christian, but Philemon is a slave owner and he owns Onesimus. So to the modern reader, it's very provocative. This is very, you know, a strange circumstance. For the original reader, it would have been very much everyday life for them. We're going to talk about um, that issue of slavery, particularly in this context. Um, but what I really want us to focus on is the fact that this book demonstrates how the gospel works to transform Christian communities. How the gospel is different from political power. How the gospel is the power of God unto salvation to all who would believe. And the gospel is not an outside force, uh, you know, pressuring people into a certain conformity of behavior. That's, that's political pressure. That's uh, the way of the world. But the gospel goes into hearts and lives and transforms people by the power of God, completely transforming who we are, our character, our worldview from the inside out. And so this book demonstrates how that works out. Uh, and it is also about forgiveness and reconciliation between these two men, uh, Philemon and Onesimus. So let's go ahead and uh, look together at the first seven verses. I'll read them. Follow along in your Bibles with me, please. Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother. To Philemon, our beloved friend and fellow laborer. To the beloved Aphia, Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church in your house. Grace to you and peace from God our Father. And the Lord Jesus Christ, I thank my God making mention of you always in my prayers, hearing of your love and faith which you have toward the Lord Jesus and toward all the saints, that the sharing of your faith may become effective by the acknowledgement of every good thing which is in you, in Christ Jesus. For we have great joy and consolation in your love, because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed by you, brother. So, uh, first let's answer the question, who is Philemon? Um, we see that Paul is the author of this book. He describes himself as a prisoner of Christ Jesus. Uh, Paul is in Rome. Um, he's been arrested for his faith in Jesus Christ. He's under house arrest. And uh, he clearly has a relationship with Philemon. Uh, notice he writes and how he describes Philemon. First, Philemon is a Christian. Uh, Philemon is a beloved friend and fellow laborer. So he's a believer in Christ. He's a friend of Paul's. They had had interaction. Paul had stayed at Philemon's house um, in Colossae. That's where um, Philemon was from. Uh, notice also Philemon is a co-laborer uh, with Paul, fellow laborer. And uh, he, he says that Philemon, notice he has a church in his house. In the uh, book of Acts, it says that the believers, they met in two places. Number one, public places. So, for example, like a park or uh, a, a temple or, or some kind of public gathering. So for us, if we think about public spaces, um, we could think of gatherings, say, in, at, at one mile or five mile or, or downtown, Chico. So in, in the first century church, they didn't have buildings. They didn't have church buildings. So they would gather in public places like that at times or house to house. That's what Paul talks about in Acts chapter 20. He says that he proclaimed the word of God to them in public and house to house. And so 
I think that's important for us to recognize that uh, fellowship um, in our homes is, is crucial and key. And I think especially right now, the time that we are living in, um, that the Lord may be stirring up in your hearts, opening your homes to have fellowship with people. Obviously, uh, most of our homes are, are not so big, but you know maybe we can host six or so people or something like that. Having um, intimate, uh, close fellowship with brothers and sisters in Christ is really, really essential. And that's what the early church uh, knew and, and understood. And I think that gave them a lot of strength internally. And uh, it, it uh, provided them an, an opportunity to really develop relationships with one another. So they had church in his house. So Philemon was a hospitable guy. Um, not only did he have a uh, house church, but he also refreshed the saints. Notice in verse 7, he says that... Um, because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed by you, brother. So uh, that word refreshed speaks of a, um, you know, feeding people, uh, providing lodging for people, refreshing travelers. Uh, verse 22, um, Paul mentions, uh, he asks Philemon if he would uh, prepare a guest room for him um, in the anticipation of Paul being released from prison in Rome. So Philemon was a hospitable man opening up his home uh, to the saints and to the church. Notice he's also a, a faithful follower of God. Verse 4, he says, making mention of you in my prayers, uh, hearing of your love and faith which you have towards the Lord. So he's a man who's faithful. He loves God and he loves the saints. He loves people. You know, that's the greatest commandment, right? Love God, love people. So he is a faithful follower of Jesus, and he's evangelistic. Notice verse 6, that the sharing of your faith may be effective. This is part of Paul's prayer for Philemon. Philemon was sharing his faith actively in his community. So all of these things are wonderful and, and great uh, examples for us, but there was one more thing about Philemon that might raise your eyebrow. <laughs> he owned a slave, Onesimus. Let's take a look at this um, for a moment. We'll, we'll read verses 8 through 20 and uh, drop back and explain some of this in a historical context. Verse 8, Therefore, though I might be very bold in Christ to command you what is fitting, yet for love's sake I rather appeal to you, being such a one as Paul the aged, and now also a prisoner of Jesus Christ, I appeal to you for my son Onesimus, whom I have begotten while in my chains, who once was unprofitable to you, but now is profitable to you and to me. I am sending him back uh, to you. Uh, I'm sending him back. You, therefore, receive him, that is, my own heart, verse 13, whom I wish to keep with me, that on your behalf he might minister to me in my chains for the gospel. But without your consent, I wanted to do nothing, that your good deed might not be by compulsion, as it were, but voluntary. For perhaps he departed for a while uh, for this purpose, that you might receive him forever, no longer as a slave, but more than a slave, a beloved brother, especially to me, by how much more to you, uh, excuse me, especially to me, but how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. If then you count me as a partner, receive him as you would me. But if he has wronged you or owes anything, put that on my account. I, Paul, am writing with my own hand. I will repay, not to mention that you you owe me even your own self besides. Yes, brother, let me have joy from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in the Lord. So, the story of Onesimus. This is how I understand it and, and what I believe this passage is teaching. Onesimus uh, may have owned Philemon money but we don't understand the circumstances. Why is Onesimus a slave? Uh, oftentimes in the ancient world, if you owed a sum of money and you couldn't pay it off, there was no option for bankruptcy. 
Uh, you had to work that debt off by selling yourself to a person. Um, we might understand it a little bit more as indentured servitude. So Onesimus finds himself in this place where he's having to work off his debt of some kind, perhaps, to Philemon. We're not sure. But Onesimus escapes. Uh, it would appear that he steals from Philemon. Notice as we read in verse 18, Paul says, but if he has wronged you or owes you anything, put that on my account, that if there is what we call a first class conditional in the Greek, which means that it could be translated since. <laughs> in other words, this is something he's done. Paul's acknowledging that uh, Onesimus has wronged Philemon in this way, stealing from him and, and running away. Uh, so, Onesimus escapes, he steals from Philemon, and Onesimus runs to Rome. Um, and in Rome, we don't know what transpires, but somehow, some way, Onesimus gets connected with the Apostle Paul. Was it that Onesimus sought out Paul? We don't know. Had Onesimus maybe interacted with Paul while Paul was traveling through and, and staying at Philemon's house? Perhaps. Um, was it that Onesimus runs into some believers in Rome and they introduce him to the Apostle Paul who's under house arrest there? It is a mystery. It's conjecture. But one thing we do know for sure, that Onesimus comes to a place in his life where he stops running. He's, he's running. He's trying to save himself. He's trying to be his own savior. And then he meets the apostle Paul who introduces him to Jesus Christ. Onesimus, notice verse 10, what Paul says, I appeal to you for my son Onesimus, whom I have begotten while in my chains. Oftentimes when Paul would lead somebody to Christ, that would be, uh, he would call him his son. This is a, a common way of, of speaking. And so Onesimus comes to faith. He stops trying to save himself. And rather than uh, trying to, uh, you know, get his own happiness or find his own way in life, he surrenders to Jesus Christ. And there uh, begins this beautiful relationship between Paul and Onesimus. Onesimus begins to co-labor with Paul in Rome. Notice verse 11, he says, uh, who once, speaking of Onesimus, was unprofitable to you. Yeah, he stole from you. He ran away. But now is profitable to you and to me. It's interesting to note that the name Onesimus means profitable. So this is a bit of a play on words um, for Paul. He said, yeah, profitable was once unprofitable, but now he really is profitable to you and to me, right? You get the idea. Um, also, verse 13, whom I wish, speaking of Onesimus, I wish to keep with me that on your behalf he might minister to me in my chains for the gospel. So here Onesimus is serving Paul. He's co-laboring with Paul in the gospel. But as Paul considers the situation, he knows what needs to happen. Onesimus, you've done wrong to Philemon. You stole from him. You were supposed to work for him, and you fled. Philemon and Onesimus need to be reconciled. And so Paul writes this letter for the purpose of seeing these two men restored in relationship. Now, here is perhaps a question that you've maybe had before. Why doesn't Paul just write to Philemon and say, hey, slavery is evil, let him go, um, by the way, all slaves in Rome should just revolt and rise up and let's burn the system down. Okay, well, let's, let's drop back and, and look at this institution of slavery in the Roman era. It was horrible. It was brutal. It was awful. Slaves had zero rights, very few protections under Roman law. But 
it's different from what we think of when we think of our American history and slavery. It was not based upon race or the color of someone's skin, uh, but as I mentioned earlier, was more like indentured servitude. People who had debts would hire themselves out to pay it off. Slavery in the Roman era was an economic reality, and there were no other options for people to pay off debts. It was usually, slavery was not usually lifelong. Instead, once someone paid off their debt, they were released. Historically, slaves generally served about 10 years and then were set free. Many slaves themselves owned slaves, right? So it's, it's, um, it's kind of something strange to us. Some slaves held positions as doctors, lawyers, administrative positions, civil servants, and so forth. So some highly skilled laborers were actually uh, slaves to other, obviously, wealthy Roman citizens. So <clears throat> that's a um, really brief kind of sketch of what Roman slavery looked at. So again, why doesn't Paul say, hey, let's burn the system down? Philemon, let this guy go. You shouldn't have never owned him in the first place. Well, what is Paul and Jesus' approach to bringing about social change. For Paul to lead a revolt or a rebellion against Rome would not be consistent with the purpose of Jesus' coming. Let's think about this for a moment. When Jesus came, his purpose was to save sinners from their sins. And he accomplished that by living a perfect life, dying on the cross, and being raised again. And the gospel is that whoever would trust in Christ as their Savior would have their sins washed away, would be given the righteousness of Jesus Christ, would be given uh, eternal life, be, be adopted into God's family, and given this beautiful relationship with God. That's, that's the gospel, and it's all received by faith, as a gift from God. That is why Jesus came. He did not come to establish uh, his earthly kingdom. Many people expected Jesus to overthrow Rome. That was what the Jews expected. They thought Messiah was going to come in and take care of Rome. At the time, the Jews were under the iron boot of the Romans. But Jesus says, I have, you know, my kingdom is, is not of this world. That uh, he didn't come to set up the kingdom in Jerusalem. He came to set up the kingdom in the world. Jesus didn't come to overthrow Rome. He came to overthrow sin and overthrow the hearts of men. That is so that they might turn and follow after him. And you know what? This was offensive to a lot of Jews. They didn't like that. Many people, when they realized that Jesus was not going to fulfill their idea of what the Messiah should be, actually turned against him. So Jesus did not come to lead a political revolution but a spiritual one. And this is so important for us to see. Christianity, the essence of it, is not a political force. It's the power of God. And it, and it doesn't change by just brute power and force and making people change from an outside force, as I mentioned earlier. But it is an internal work of God. That's the promise of the new covenant, that God would change hearts and, and change minds by writing not on tablets of stone, but rather writing on tablets of the heart. Not with a chisel and a hammer, but with the Holy Spirit. That's what 2 Corinthians chapter 3 talks about. So this is very, very important for us to understand the nature and the essence of Christianity and how true change actually takes place in a society and in people. Paul similarly didn't write to raise a, a political opposition to Rome, but instead he wrote to instruct the church 
in what the gospel actually is and how the gospel thoroughly transforms hearts, which leads to transformed families and transformed communities. So, in other words, um, I was reading a commentator. He said this, what Paul's letters do is to bring us into an atmosphere where the institution of slavery could only wilt and die. In other words, it's not a full frontal attack from the outside, but it's something that goes into the inside of something and, and kills it from the inside out, okay? The, the gospel addresses the real issue, which is the hearts of men, the hearts of people, and changing and transforming that. And notice how this is true in the book of Philemon. Paul is telling Philemon, listen. Notice verse 15. He says, For perhaps he, that is Onesimus, departed for a while for this purpose, that you might receive him forever, no longer as a slave, but more than a slave, a beloved brother, especially to me, but now how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. Verse 17, if then you count me a partner, receive him, how? As you would me. Philemon, this is your brother. Onesimus is your brother. You need to love him and treat him as your brother. And when he comes to you with this letter, you need to receive him as you would receive me. In other words, yes, you're a master over him, but he is your brother in Christ. And now in the gospel, Paul writes in Galatians 3.28, there's neither Jew nor Greek, there's neither slave nor free, there's neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. So this whole idea of the master-slave relationship is radically transformed when you realize, hey, yes, you, you might be this guy's master, but you need to love him just like you, you love your brother. You need to watch out for his needs and, and care for him just the way that you watch out for your own needs. You need to be gentle with this person. You need to watch out for their best interests. You see, that begins to radically transform things. And so within the New Testament church, within you know, gospel communities, Christian communities, you may still have this language of master and slave. You might still have an outward shell of what might, could be called slavery, but the essence of it's completely changed. <laughs> you have people, masters, who are loving their slaves, loving those who are serving them. You have slaves who are not working for masters, but instead working for the Lord Jesus Christ seeking to do their work, not as unto men, but as unto the Lord, to honor Christ in the way that they live and work. You see how that's totally different? And that's what the gospel seeks to establish. That's what the gospel is seeking to do. That's what God wants to do with our hearts, with the gospel, is to change and transform us. And this is what would ultimately lead to the abolishment of slavery, right? As you begin to relate this way to people, all those old vestiges and, and, and harsh treatment and all of that stuff, it goes away. And this again is how the gospel works to transform lives, communities, and nations. The gospel levels all human beings to one equal footing. <laughs> no matter who you are, where you come from, the color of your skin, what your station is in life, what you are, how you are economically, we are all level at the foot of the cross. God sees sinners who are in need of his grace. And Jesus Christ came to die for all humanity for everyone from what we would call the lowest 
to the highest. All are equal at the foot of the cross. And he gives this gift of salvation to all who would believe, not based on their race, not based on their sex or, or their gender or these things, all these different identities that we make or, or, or you know, and, and they are genuine. There is male and female. There is Jew and Gentile. Husband and wife, you know, those are our are genuine categories. However, we aren't to lord ourselves over one another. That's what the Gentiles do. But we're to look at each other as equals, as level at the foot of the cross. And we're to see other people as valued, valued and loved by God. This is how the gospel works in our hearts to give us true humility. That there is no claim, there's nothing that we can stand on or hold on to to say, hey, look, at God values me more because of A, B, C, or D. No. We're, we're equal at the foot of the cross. And we come to God through Jesus Christ. Jesus is the, the mediator between God and man. And I don't have a leg up on you or an advantage on you because I'm a pastor or anything like that. But no, we each have equal access right into the throne room of God. Not because of what we've done or who we are or any other identity, but because of what Jesus Christ has done. That's the gospel. And that truth transforms human relationships. And so, as God has loved me, as he has poured out his grace upon me, this unearned forgiveness, this unearned righteousness, this unearned eternal life and relationship with God, he has given me so much grace and so much forgiveness, so I am to love other people the same way. I am to forgive as I have been forgiven. And so even when people wrong me, for example, here in this story, Onesimus has wronged Philemon. Philemon, Paul counsels, you need to forgive him as you've been forgiven in Christ Jesus. You need to receive him as you would receive me. Christianity doesn't change people by political power, but by the inner work of the Holy Spirit as the gospel seeks to change and transform every facet of who I am and shape my human relationships, my character, my thinking. So, how does this apply to you? Perhaps you've been like Onesimus. You've sinned against others. Perhaps you've taken something. You've hurt somebody else. You've wronged somebody else. Perhaps tonight you're running. You're far from God. Here's the beautiful truth. That the scripture says, whoever would believe in Christ Jesus, all that can be forgiven, set free. You can be set free from sin. You can stop running tonight and turn back to the Father. Jesus gives a beautiful story in Luke uh, chapter 15 about the prodigal son. And it's an interesting parallel here to this book, Philemon. Because there in the prodigal son story, um, you, you have this son who wrongs his father. He disrespects his father, gets money from his dad. He flees. He he ends up in hard straits and difficult times. He comes to the end of himself. That prodigal stops running and realizes, I, I can't run anymore. And he comes to himself and he says, man, if I could just go back and just be a servant, just be a, a slave of my dad's, it'd be better than, than life here. And so that son comes back 
And how does the father respond in the story? He sees his son far way off. And the father does something that was unheard of and very uncharacteristic for men in that time. Old man starts running. I lived in Kenya for several years. And you know what? I don't think I ever saw one time an old man running. It was just not, they, they had all the time in the world. <laughs> they, you waited on them. If they were crossing the street and you were coming, they, they, didn't, they didn't trot, they just would mosey on. <laughs> uh, they, they took their time, and it's a form of respect. They're, you're the one who waits on them. They're not operating according to your timetable, right? And so that's what's so fascinating in this story in Luke chapter 15 is the father sees his son, and he runs towards the son and he meets the son and rather than you know pouring out condemnation on the son he kisses him he embraces him he puts on his finger the ring bringing him back into the family he puts on him a robe covering him in righteousness this is the heart of God the father towards you tonight. If you've been running, the Father wants to welcome you back into the family. He meets you tonight, not with disapproval and, 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 and trying to pour more shame out on you, but to say, you've come back and I want to welcome you into the family. That's the heart of God. A kiss, a ring, a robe. That's what he does in a party, yeah. He, that's, that's, it's a celebration, right? And, and, well, perhaps you're on the other side of things. Perhaps you've been wronged like Philemon. And you're upset at the person who's wronged you. Well, here now is where the, the nature and the heart of God begins to be imparted to you because this is what God desires is that in the same way in that story of the prodigal son, how the father receives the repentant son, so we are to receive those who wronged us. Not with condemnation, but with open hearts, ready to forgive. Why is it that the father could run to the son at that point and embrace him well it's because while the son was off and away every day the father was embracing his son in his heart that is to say he wasn't harboring bitterness and anger toward his son who had so disrespected and dishonored him and done wrong to him and so it is for us those who have disrespected you, dishonored you, hurt you. As Jesus Christ has forgiven you freely, as he's poured out his grace upon you freely, as he's covered you in righteousness freely, he says, so you are to forgive those who've done wrong to you. Forgiveness is costly. It costs God the Father something his son. The, the, the wrath that should have been poured out upon us was instead poured out upon his son. And so God absorbed in himself what we deserved. There in uh, Matthew chapter 5, Jesus says, if somebody turns your cheek, if somebody slaps you in the face, you're to turn the other cheek. Now, that doesn't mean you slap theirs. You know, turn their cheek, too. No. <laughs> That's the law, you know, eye for an eye kind of thing. That's not New Testament Christianity. Instead, you absorb that wrong. That's what Jesus is saying. You absorb the wrong done to you into yourself. Why? Well, number one, it's because that's how God has loved you. Number two, that's how you become a witness to the rest of the world 
what the gospel of grace is. This is radical. Paul says, Philemon, you've had stuff stolen from you. If he's wronged you, verse 18, he owes you anything, hey, charge it to me. I'll, I'll take the wrong. I'll pay you back. But, but keep in mind, I didn't charge you and I preached the gospel to you. <laughs> keep in mind that uh, I have, you know, I'm in prison right now. Keep in mind that I'm being treated unjustly. Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus. Keep in mind that I'm, I'm fully serving you with my very life here in prison. So this is radical. So maybe you're Onesimus, maybe you're Philemon, but for all of us, we need tonight to receive the grace of God, to be quick to forgive. And we need to recognize too that our battle as believers is not political. This is so important for our time. That our battle is not against flesh and blood. It's not against systems of government. It's not against Democrats. God has sent you as believers into the world as ambassadors, not of a political party but of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And therefore, our hearts are to be soft towards all people, regardless of what they believe or their lifestyle or their political affiliation. We as believers represent a different kingdom and we need to realize that real change will only take place when the hearts of men and women are changed by the gospel. Not by my ability to argue somebody into a pretzel and, and show my superiority and how better my ideas are. No, it's by their hearts being changed by the Holy Spirit. So, so many important, for things, uh, so many important things for us to consider. So let's not put our hope in political systems or leaders, but place our hope fully and completely in Jesus Christ. And you know what? One day Jesus is going to return and he is gonna set up his kingdom here on earth. And it is gonna be in Jerusalem. And righteousness is gonna cover the earth like waters cover the sea. The knowledge of the Lord will cover the earth like waters cover the sea. But that's his work. That's something he does. For now, we're called to be his light, to be his salt, represent him here on earth until he comes. Let's just finish up this book and we'll, um, we'll call it a night. Having, verse 21, having confidence in your obedience, I write to you knowing that you will do more than I say. But meanwhile, prepare a guest room for me for I trust that through your prayers I shall be granted to you. Uh, that is to say, Paul was in jail and he's knowing that he's gonna be released. He's trusting that that's gonna take place. Verse 23, Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, greets you, as do Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, Luke, my fellow laborers. Verse 25, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. The grace, that's it right there. The grace of God. That's what's going to change you. That's what's going to transform you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the gospel. Thank you for this truth. Thank you for this story. We trust, Lord, that... Um, as you work things out in Philemon and Onesimus' lives, Lord, you're gonna do the same work in us. I pray, Father, that our hearts would be softened and transformed by your grace, that those who have wronged us, Lord, we would tonight 
lay that hurt down, that we would know your heart of forgiveness for us, that we would let go of wrath and thoughts of vengeance, that we would entrust true justice into your hands, Lord, and may we be ambassadors of heaven. And I want to take a moment, too, to just open up an opportunity for anyone here tonight who is far from God, and you've been on the run, and you tonight have heard God calling you back into his family. Do you understand that Christ died for your sins and that three days later he rose again, conquering sin and death? That you desire to be forgiven of your sins, to be clothed in the righteousness of Jesus Christ, to be given the promise of eternal life and a relationship with your creator, God the Father. Is there anyone here tonight who just by faith says, yes, I desire that. I want to receive that tonight. Just raise your hand and say, yes, God, I want to receive that gift. Is there anyone here tonight? Well, Father, please change and transform us by your grace. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hey, let's all stand.